Hello, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Guys, Jyoti ma'am will be joining in five minutes. So let's just wait for her to wait. join. She has messaged. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Harneet and everybody. Just need good, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. Harneet. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, Professor Jyati Ghosh, she's from uh, Delhi University? Sir, she's from JNU. JNU, okay. She has retired from JNU. Okay. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, ma'am. Hello. Uh, sorry about that. My camera was not working, and I've had to do some other strange things. I hope it lasts through the, the program. Hello, <laughs> Professor Jati Ghosh. Hello. Good afternoon, ma'am. Can, can we just start with the event? Certainly, let's do that. I'm I'm going to try and get uh, the load on the Wi-Fi. So, okay, okay Simran, you can start with the welcome. Uh, good afternoon to all. Thank you for joining us today. On behalf of Ecotrust, the Economic Society of Sri Guru Tegh Bahadur Khalsa College, we welcome you all to our economics lecture series. We have with us today our speaker, Professor Jayati Ghosh. Professor Ghosh is currently a professor at University of Massachusetts Amherst, USA. She retired from the prestigious Jawaharlal Nehru University in 2020 after teaching for nearly 35 years. Earlier this year, she was named by the United Nations to a high-level advisory board 
comprising of 20 prominent personalities globally renowned for their intellectual leadership in economic and social fields. Author of several books, journal articles and a regular contributor to newspaper columns and blogs, her proficiency in economics has been awarded by the Distinguished Contributions to the Social Sciences in India in 2015, the International Labor, Organi Labor Organization's Decent Work Research Prize for 2010, and the Nordsat Prize for Social Sciences 2010, Italy. I, on behalf of our principal, Professor Jaswinder Singh, Vice Principal Dr. Jassal Singh, our teachers and the students, extend a warm welcome to you, Professor Ghosh. While the lecture is going on, everyone is requested to keep their mics off. If you have questions, please write them in the chat section and they will be addressed at the end of the lecture. Now, uh, before we begin, I would like to invite our Vice Principal, Dr. Jassal Singh, to say a few words. Hello, everybody. Today is our esteemed speaker, Professor Jenti Ghosh from JNU. And our vice, our principal, Dr. Jaswinder Singh, who could not come here at this time due to the, some meeting in the university. Dr. Dipali, Arneet Kaur, other faculty members, and all the students. It is a great occasion that the Eco Trist, the Economic Society of SGTV Khalsa College, is organizing the second edition of lecture series talk by Professor Jyoti Ghash from JNU on the topic entitled The Economic Consequences of Divided World Today. So I will not take much time between the students and the, our esteemed speaker. Just I would like to state that if we look back a century back, that is in the 19th century, the world economy was in the hands of the few capitalist forces. And today, the free world is far from the uniform economic orders. The today, the world is much smaller place in comparison to the 50 years back with the change in technology, travel and transportation. The process of shrinkage also holds true for communication of ideas, dissemination of knowledge, and also exchange of economic views of the world. There is a deep cleavage in the economic and social order with separates the which separates the free world and the world ruled by the totalitarian communism, communists. Free world economy ranges from real capitalism as it is in the US, Canada, Belgium, and Switzerland to the countries in Russian order, including the China. None of the free world countries has a complete foreign trade policy as all communist countries have. In free countries, the economic activities is still carried by the private sectors, private enterprises, and the scope of public enterprises and government control and regulations of private business has grown everywhere. Thus the view of the, thus the non of the free world countries has a complete foreign trade policy such as all communist countries has. In free, world, in free countries, the economic activity is still carried out by the private enterprises. So, so I will not take much time in between the our students, audience, and the, our speaker. So, I would like to request our speaker to please give her talks on the topics and titles. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to join you all. And uh, I'm, I've really joined because my former student is now teaching here. I'm sorry that she could not be present today. And I really do hope that her mother gets well soon. So please give her my warmest regards. 
and I'm going to speak, I, I think, for about half an hour, and then we'll get questions, because I think it's always much more interesting to be responding to your questions. I think uh, Professor Jassel has just outlined a, a view of the global economy in terms of how different it is from a century ago. And in many ways, he's absolutely right. But it's also true that it's not very different in many ways. And that's a little disconcerting. And we have to think of the critical reason, uh, the various factors behind the fact that it's not very different. And when I'm talking about the lack of a major significant difference, it's really in terms of the relative power of certain kinds of economies in the world, uh, because that affects economic prospects, uh, whether through free markets or through states. And in fact, at the moment, we have both states and free markets operating in unprecedented ways, which are affecting this division. Now, why have I said it's a divided world? And why have I said that this is kind of similar to the world of even a century ago? It's divided essentially because of three or four major features. Some are the outcome of the pandemic. Some are the outcome of tendencies that were emerging over the last decade or two. So the first is really the fact of vaccine inequality, or as I called it, vaccine apartheid really uh, which was evident and has been evident in the world now for a year and what does that mean it means that vaccines that were developed across the world but mainly in the advanced economies and in a couple of other countries largely with the benefit of public resources i think we have to remember that it was government spending that generated these vaccines not private enterprise okay and we can talk about that in more detail but even the vaccines that are now controlled by big multinational companies like Pfizer, Moderna, and so on, were all developed through public spending. Uh, AstraZeneca, 95% public spending uh, uh, in terms of developing its particular vaccine, which we in India know as Covishield. Pfizer, about 90% of the mRNA technology was developed in government labs in public labs in the United States, United Kingdom, Hungary, and elsewhere. The final push was given in the case of Pfizer actually by a German company, BioNTech, which received 455 million in German euros in German government subsidies to do that. And by Moderna in the US, which was entirely government funded. All of its R&D spending was government funded. Um, and so on. I could go on listing all the different examples. But although these were uh, created with public spending, they have uh, they essentially become private property. They have become the intellectual property of the big pharma companies, which means that they have not been spread. Okay, So there are two reasons why only 2% of Africa has been fully vaccinated, uh, why only 25% of Latin America has been fully vaccinated. Whereas the countries like the European Union and the US have vaccinated everybody vaccinated. That is 100% vaccination of anyone who is willing. And they have thrown away millions of vaccines because they have expired. So what actually happened is that Although these vaccines were developed very, very quickly, very dramatically uh, quickly because of the urgency that was felt about controlling the pandemic, the uh, governments uh, then basically did pre-orders with the big companies and in very opaque ways, non-transparent ways. So while there was an international facility set up by the World Health Organization, to buy vaccines and distribute them equitably across countries, that facility didn't have a chance because all of the governments, the rich country governments, were negotiating with these companies to buy up their entire stock for the year. By October 2020, they had already done the purchase of 85% of the vaccines in production uh, that would be produced in 2021. They had bought up for themselves. They had then stockpiled. The US bought four to five times what it needs. Canada bought 11 times what it needs. 
uh, France bought three times what it needs and so on and so forth. Okay, so they all bought excess. And as I said, a lot of that has actually had to be thrown away because they they now have, they're facing, you know, vaccine resistance from a section of their population. And anyway, they bought far too much. And that's really why the developing world has not been vaccinated in time. And that lack of vaccination is also why we have mutations, we have new variants. The Delta variant everybody talks about, but there are other new variants that could well emerge. And we are lucky that so far, uh, none of these has been completely resistant to the vaccines, but that need not happen. You know, viruses are notoriously uh, enthusiastic in terms of reinventing themselves. Vaccine inequality in turn has meant that actually this pandemic is not over for most of the world. And even in the developed world, even in the same you know, developed world that thought that by grabbing all the vaccines, they could then look after themselves and never mind everybody else, you find that it's coming back through the unvaccinated population and through the new variants, which also impact the vaccinated. Okay. So the first big division in the world is in terms of vaccine availability. India, we are in a peculiar position because we have our own vaccine. Of course, we messed up in terms of rushing the approval and it's a long delay in getting WHO approval. But even our own vaccine, we did not multiply the production. We did not give the, the intellectual property that would allow this vaccine to be uh, developed to other companies, which we could have done, because this is something that is developed with the ICMR. And so we also don't have enough vaccines to go around. And that's also why our vaccine uh, vaccination program has been delayed. We, I mean, today we are celebrating the one, the one billionth vaccine, right? The 100 core vaccine is a big celebration today. Yes, it's an achievement, but in fact, we could have done this a few months ago if we had actually enabled more vaccine producers, which is completely possible, since there are about eight companies that are willing and able to do this, including public sector companies. So the longer we delay vaccination, the more we are still under threat of the pandemic, the more we are unable to resume normal economic life, and the more the recovery and employment and livelihoods are affected. This is not just true in India, it's true across the developing world. And of course, some countries are hit more than others. So that's the first big difference. The second big difference, and it's going to be the same set of countries each time that have the differences, okay? Uh, the second big difference is in fiscal response to this pandemic. How much have governments ramped up additional spending and eased monetary policy because of this dramatic sh shock that we all faced? from the beginning of last year. So the advanced economies have been unbelievably expansionary. It's you know not even in the era of Keynes did you get this kind of public spending. The advanced economies have spent anything, additional spending beyond what they had already budgeted for, additional spending of anything between 10 to 25, 30% of GDP. That's the kind of additional spending we are talking about. I mean, unbelievable. They've never done this except in some countries in wartime. This is the first time you have had, let's say the top 10 or the top 20 advanced economies just spending massive amounts additionally to help the economies recover. Some of this went in social protection. Some of this went in just, you know, uh, saving businesses, bailouts, making sure business, small and large businesses don't collapse. Some of this went in infrastructure spending to gear up for the next round of possible threats, including climate change. But the point is that they spent hugely. Emerging markets and developing countries, by contrast, really have spent even less than they spent during the global financial crisis. Just after, if you look at the G12, well, the G11 of G20, you know, the G20 group of countries contains 11 developing countries emerging market and developing countries. If you look at their spending in this period between January and March 2021, uh, they have spent less than they spent in 2008-2009, additional money. 
And it's nowhere near this. You know, the fiscal expansion ranges from about 1.5% to 2% of GDP in the case of Mexico and India to about 6%, 7% of GDP in the case of Brazil. Okay, so really very, very small compared to the advanced economies. Let me put it to you in another way. The per capita increased government spending in the United States in this period was more than $25,000. Per person, they spent an additional $25,000, okay? The per capita spending in the low-income countries was $2, $2 additionally, okay? So just think of those dimensions, $25,000 per person compared to $2 per person. Now, you're all economists. I don't have to tell you what that means in terms of the ability of that economy to recover. The less you spend, and remember, it's a pandemic. You've anyway closed down a lot of supply and you've destroyed a lot of livelihoods. People are not able to spend. Businesses are not going to invest in a world in which there is no market and it's shrinking. So it's only the government, really, that can spend and help the economy to recover. And yet, for various reasons, developing countries have spent less and they have hardly compensated for that massive decline. India and Mexico are, as I said, outlier countries in this. We are really extreme in the sense that we have spent less than we could have. But a number of other countries have spent less simply because they can't. They're already spending on debt service, even more than they spend on health. They are spending on um, a range of other things which doesn't allow them or they are worried about capital flight. So the capital flight issue is a very serious issue. Developing countries with open capital accounts have often faced very serious capital flight or credit rating downgrades whenever it's perceived that the fiscal deficit is getting too large. Now, this is crazy because no notice that advanced economies don't face this problem. They've been massively increasing the fiscal deficit, no problem right? Uh, credit rating agencies are fine, everybody's fine. Developing countries, the minute they start raising spending, there is capital flight, or there is the fear of capital flight. And obviously, this restrains people even before they do anything. But it also is that many countries, at least 80 countries, are burdened by debt, are burdened by foreign debt that they simply cannot repay. They got a moratorium, uh, I think you all know what a moratorium means, right? It basically means you don't have to pay interest over that period. But then at the end of that period, you get that whole big package of interest to pay again. So you don't get rid of that past interest payment. It gets added onto your later interest payments. It doesn't really solve your problem. And this also has constrained the public spending. What does that mean? It means that, first of all, there's a two-track recovery. The advanced countries and then the rest of the world. But also that even that global recovery is threatened. It's not just that the rest of the world is 80% of the world's population. Of course, that's true and that's important. But it is also that you can't have such a two-track recovery without impacting the entire recovery, if you see what I mean. You cannot get a few countries recovering quickly, but the rest of the world declining, because then that means trade, investment, all of the things that uh, Professor Jessel mentioned earlier, all of these things are also impacted. And that reduces the possibility of a global recovery. The IMF has just come out with its latest uh, World Economic Outlook, which uh, it is produced, as you probably know, by Gita Gopinath, former student of Delhi University. And uh, it says pretty much the same thing, that not only is it a two-tiered differential recovery, but in fact, it's, a, um, it's one that is now under threat. Because the pandemic is not leaving us, because the large part of the world is not able to get back on track, in terms of the economy and livelihoods, employment are still very, very badly affected. And that in turn is going to come back and hit the developed countries. 
Then there's another thing which developing countries face, that sort of triple whammy, if you like. Not only do we have a persistence of the pandemic, I know that people in Delhi, at least I'm sitting in Delhi right now, seem to think it's all over, it's all gone, right? Everybody's out in the markets and getting ready for Deepavali and, and pretending that there's no illness. Uh, we know that this was also the case in March, okay? And we also know that uh, we still haven't vaccinated enough of the population to feel as comfortable as we should. But uh, we also know that despite all of that, the economy has not recovered fully. Okay? It's still way below the levels that it was even pre-pandemic levels, February 2020, let us say. It's still way below that in terms of consumption, investment, employment, all the major indicators. But there is now, as I said, the triple whammy, and that is the possibility of inflation. So what has happened is that because the US spent so much and recovered so rapidly, and because China had controlled the virus so quickly, by March 2020, it had really controlled the virus and got everything going again and had started producing again big time and its economy was roaring back as well. You had a demand for primary products and for raw materials. And you had a disruption of supply chains because of the continuing pandemic that led to the rising prices of certain raw materials and certain intermediate goods. And so we have now globally a rise in price of primary products, particularly some food articles, but also some intermediate goods. And I suppose you've all heard about the coal crisis in India, but basically there is a problem with regard to all of the, the carbon-based fuels and energy prices in general, but there's also a problem in certain raw materials. Now, all of this necessarily feeds into inflation. Okay, Energy prices feed directly into all other prices because you need energy to produce, you need energy to transport goods. So energy prices are automatically going to feed into all other prices. In India, a significant part of the energy price is really because of taxation. As you probably know, the energy Fuel taxes have been raised about 16 times in the last one year alone. And um, in Delhi, the fuel, the taxes account for about 56% of the price. In some other states, it's a little bit more, but definitely more than half of the price is just the fuel taxes. But in many other countries, that's not the case. It is the global price that is driving it. So you have the fuel taxes rising, you have global food prices rising, which in turn, because of the fact that global trade in food is now much more liberalized and open, affects all countries. And that in turn is really problematic for a whole bunch of developing countries because it does actively raise the specter of stagflation. You're all too young to know what that means. You would certainly not have lived through the stagflation of the 1970s, okay? It tells you how old I am, that I remember it vividly. But around the 1970s, I was around your age. And this is the period where you have either declining or slowing down output, but rising prices, okay, which is not supposed to happen according to economics textbooks. If you remember, there's supposed to be a Phillips curve in which there's a relationship between output and the price level. So this caught a lot of the standard economists by surprise. This was essentially cost push inflation, inflation driven by a rise in costs, and it kept happening even though demand was falling. Okay, And this is really a real possibility today. I'm not saying it's already happened. It hasn't yet happened, but it, the tendencies are there. And so that's, if you like, the third big threat that can happen to developing countries in what is a divided world. But I said there were a bunch of other reasons, and let me just highlight these. One of them, it has to do with intellectual property rights. I already mentioned that in the case of vaccines, didn't I? I said that um, you know the vaccines were developed with public money, but they're now controlled by a few big companies. Now, why is that? Because they hold the patent rights. They hold the rights to make this product and the knowledge that goes with making this product. You may probably know that this is all the result of the TRIPS agreement, the Trade Related Intellectual Property Rights Agreement of the WTO, 
which um, allows for governments to actually issue compulsory licenses if companies are behaving in a mon monopolistic way. So the TRIPS agreement actually allows for compulsory licensing. It does recognize that, you know, if it's being misused, these patent rights, you can actually work against it. Nonetheless, that's not good enough. Uh, um, okay, the, I guess the hands we'll deal with later uh, when I finish. Or is, if it's a question that's clarificatory, please do just uh, go ahead and ask it. But uh, otherwise, I'll just wait till I finish. And so we have question answers down at, by the end. Okay, no, I think someone raised a hand. I saw it, so I'm just wondering whether uh, we need it's a clarificatory question or not. If not, I'll proceed. The TRIPS agreement allows for compulsory licensing, but why is that not good enough in a time like this? Because to make these vaccines, it's not just one patent or two patents. The mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, they need 62 patents because of all the different processes that are all patented, okay? It's a nightmare. You have to do, every government has to issue a compulsory license, company to company, product by product, process by process. So it will take years to do all of those, which is why South Africa and India had led a, an, an attempt in the WTO to ask for a TRIPS waiver, okay, in the WTO. The, uh, that is to say, waive all the patents for not just vaccines, but treatments, uh, you know, tests, all of the things that we need to deal with the pandemic, waive them for the period of the pandemic so that we can get over the pandemic and then we can actually move on to the next, you know, set of problems. But during the pandemic, everything that is related to COVID-19, let us not worry about these intellectual property rights. The advanced countries have been blocking this in the WTO. I mean, more than a hundred and 56 countries are in support of this, but a few advanced countries are blocking it. The US stopped blocking it, but it hasn't really pushed for it to get changed. Uh, France, Germany, the UK, they're all, you know, their multinational companies are all affected, so they have been blocking this. And that's serious because it means, and remember, this is actually a, a small thing to do. It's a relatively what we call low hanging fruit, you know? It's not a big deal to just waive the uh, uh, IPRs for a couple of years and get the pandemic over with and then move on. But it, even this was not done. And that has an impact in all of the things that I've just mentioned. But also it means that now that we're going to be facing even bigger threats like climate change, which require a lot of new technology and a lot of that technology is being developed in different parts of the world, especially in the advanced countries. We need to spread that technology. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to mitigate climate change. We're not going to be able to adapt to it. So there's a serious problem in terms of the way we have created a stranglehold over knowledge through large companies, even when the research is publicly funded. And that in turn is affecting not just growth prospects, but I would argue even affecting survival prospects. Okay, for large parts of the world. So that's the other consequence. And then there is the role of fine. Well, that's the second last. The second last is the role of finance. I've already told you how financial flows affect um, the uh, possibility of fiscal expansion in developing countries. We're so terrified that, you know, bond markets will punish us, our uh, credit rating will fall and all of that, that we don't dare to expand our public spending even when we need to. But finance plays other roles as well. Finance creates boom bust cycles in particular developing economies. You think you're doing very well and you think you're getting a boom, but in fact, it's a very temporary boom and it actually shifts the incentives away from producing tradable goods to non-tradable goods. And so the minute you're trade deficit starts expanding too much, then the finance ups and leaves. It says, oh, that's a very dangerous country. It's a risky country. Let's move on to the next country. And that gives you a lot of instability, a lot of financial stability, because every time finance leaves in that way, it also creates a domestic banking crisis. Okay, so many concerns about finance. 
There's also the fact that, you know, we keep talking, I don't know if you have been following any of the discussions about the environment and climate change. There's going to be a big meeting, the COP26, you probably know, in ne next month, um, that there is a lot of discussion about how much more money we need to fund this transition to a green, clean, green kind of planet, right? And people keep talking about where will we get the money, how will we get the money, etc. Nobody talks about the fact that unregulated finance is actually making things much browner and dirtier as we speak. You know, we all know that coal is the worst possible way you can get energy. It's the worst. It's the most damaging. It's the most uh, carbon emitting. Even among fossil fuels, it's the worst. But coal investment goes on. So part of it is that governments permit it in the desperation to keep economic growth growing at any cost. But part of it is also because private finance pays for it. So the biggest funders of coal are eight US finance companies like BlackRock and others, and a couple of European companies. These are the funders of coal investments globally. And so finance is unregulated in terms of doing the bad stuff. And then all the governments are desperate scrounging around looking for money to do the good stuff and finally we have the fact of a technology shift okay it's just beginning we are beginning to see automation digitalization artificial intelligence we're beginning to see some of that impact but once again it's very two track right and it's two track not only between countries it's two track within countries all of us can have this lecture online but we know that even in our city, there is a very large proportion of students who cannot access. So there's no way they have the bandwidth, the connectivity, even the ability to buy data that would enable them to participate in a lecture like this. And that's in the city of Delhi. We know the digital divide in India is massive, okay? So the fact that there is now real dramatic technological progress in all kinds of ways, not just artificial intelligence, but you know, 3D printing, which allows you to produce from scratch a whole thing where you don't need to outsource a bit and a piece of it to Philippines or Thailand or China or Korea or anywhere else. All of that is going to dramatically change the nature of trade. It has begun doing it, but it's not that much. And that has a very important implication. You know, in the past, we used to see manufacturing as the route to, you know, moving up the ladder. And of course, it still remains very important and essential. But part of that moving up the ladder was that it employed more and more people. That is no longer the case. Even when you do a greater shift into manufacturing output, you're not going to be employing as many people. You're going to be employing less people. Even China today employs less people in manufacturing than it did in 2000. Two decades after its big boom, massive expansion, it is employing less people in manufacturing because it is moving very rapidly to the new technologies. More than anyone else, it's really dramatically investing in robotization, artificial intelligence, all of these things. And so we have to recognize that we need to invest in manufacturing. Absolutely. We're not going to be getting ahead without it, but it's not going to solve our employment problem. We have to think of other things. And that's another important thing that we have to bear in mind. Now, everything I've said has been really depressing, right? It's all bad news, bad news, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's important to know what we have to confront if we're going to do something about it. And I'm, I know you're bound to ask, what, are you, what can you do about it? How can you solve this? And in a way, uh, some of the solutions require getting rid of the things that I have already mentioned, getting rid of the intellectual property right regime that enables private companies to profit over publicly funded technologies and to restrict the spread of the, that knowledge in a way that doesn't just harm development, but it kills people, right? People die because they don't get the vaccine and so on. Um, it also requires controls over finance nationally and regionally, internationally, so that they can't just create havoc. They can't create boom-bust cycles. They can't invest in really dirty industries and so on, okay? 
and that they are forced. I mean, perhaps we should bring in regulations that if you're going to invest in a in the coal sector, then you have to spend double that amount investing in a green energy sector. Yeah, um, we have to make available much more fiscal resources to developing countries. The IMF brought in a big expansion of special drawing rights, uh, which. Uh, was it's historically the largest, but it's still very small relative to the need. In fact, even the IMF itself had originally said that the, we need one trillion. Way back in March 2020, they said we need one trillion. We've got 650 billion. Okay, you know, 500 billion SDRs is 650 billion dollars. Remember, developing countries get a very small share of that. 60% goes to rich countries who are not going to spend it. Okay. So developing countries get very small shares. For some countries, it's still a big amount relative to their own balance of payments and relative to their own fiscal strategy. So, you know, it's better than nothing for sure. But the 60% that all the rich countries are getting, which they don't need to spend and they won't spend, we should be recycling these. We should be telling the rich countries, put it into a fund that automatically buys up vaccines and distributes them equally in the world. The COVAX hasn't worked. Let's just do that, that right now, immediately, OK? Uh, we should be thinking of a technology access pool. WHO has that for COVID. It hasn't worked again, but we're going to need it for a whole range of other threats. Let's think of a technology access pool where patents are purchased globally and made available to everybody, because we need technologies that help us to adapt to climate change and mitigate climate change, OK? And Let's think of ways of undoing the kinds of inequalities that come about through the protectionism that is emerging in the rich countries. You know, because the other fact that has happened is that you're getting more and more inward looking policies across the world. And those inward looking policies are also enabled by technology. You know, the reshoring of production. Obama started it in the US. Trump has con come, Trump continued it. It's proceeding under Biden. The moving away from offshoring to what is called reshoring, using new technologies where you can get, you know, artificial intelligence to do what people in call centers in Mumbai used to do. And so we need to think of ways in which we can democratize the way the technology works so that it doesn't again create yet another divide globally okay this can be done it's not impossible i mean basically let's face it we're going to have to do it unless we want humanity to be destroyed it's really a question of survival it's not just anymore you know bad news and a bad time for a few years it's a very very serious threat we are on the verge of very deep catastrophe and therefore, I believe, you know, humanity has always stepped back from the brink. And I think it will do that once again. I think it will step back from the brink. And there are solutions available out there. We just have to make sure that there's enough public demand for those solutions, that they're actually taken up seriously by governments. OK. All right, let me stop here. I'm sure there are lots of questions. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for such an enriching session. So let's just start with the question and answer round. Uh, so the uh, request to audience, please uh, put up the questions in the chat box. So first question I would like to ask, ma'am. So given you have to, uh, talked about finance, so mm -hmm. I would like to ask about the Insolvency Bankruptcy Board of India that since we were so optimistic about it in the starting, what do you think is the future? You know, I think we have to confess that it hasn't worked. Yeah. And uh, the rates of recovery have been pathetic. Uh, they were expected to be at least four or five times what we have seen. I think the uh, current rate of recovery is about 11%. Um, most of the things that have gone in, the process turns out to be much more complicated than anyone had anticipated. And some of them have also faced legal problems. Okay. I think the government also realizes that it hasn't worked because that's why we now have proposals for a bad bank, right? A bank that will take over all the bad loans of the other commercial banks and thereby get, the, get it off the balance sheets of the commercial banks. That's, 
that too has got lots of pitfalls, okay? So we have to recognize that, you know, a lot of this, these loans have to be restructured. Sometimes it's better to do it cleanly, but there is a real problem with doing it in a way that generates moral hazard. Okay, that's the problem with all bailouts, that there's a moral hazard, right? They, especially for big guys, they feel that they can get away with a lot because they will get bailed out. And that has happened for many of our large corporates. It has happened also in cases of outright fraud, like Nirav Modi and others. But it has even happened with a more lackadaisical approach, shall we say, to repayment on the part of large corporates who historically have been bailed out. I don't know how many of you are aware, you know, every time there's a farm loan waiver, there's a massive outcry, public outrage, articles in the newspapers about how this is terrible, affects the you, the biggest farm loan waiver we've had was 65,000 crore, right? In the UPA two, I think it was in 2014, <coughs> in early 2014 or late 2013, we had a big farm, or maybe even earlier. Anyway, we had a big farm loan waiver, right? No, sorry, it was just before the financial crisis, 2008, right? That was 65,000 crore. Every year, at least 80,000 to 1 lakh crore is written off by commercial banks for large borrowers every year. So we are doing much bigger loan waivers every year quietly without any noise being made in any newspaper. I mean, probably most people are not even aware that it's so large, this loan waiver. The IBC was an attempt to actually resolve that, to, to, to make them pay up, okay? It hasn't worked. I think it's a combination of the design and the implementation, which uh, you know really needs to be tweaked. I would argue that we should try and revamp the I IBC, make that more effective, rather than go for a bad bank, because the bad bank gives you another set of moral hazard issues. Yeah, and this time the moral hazard is for both the companies that don't pay and the banks. So that's really quite problematic. Okay, ma'am. Another question is related to the off-budget borrowing. So as we have talked about fiscal deficit, so right now the fiscal deficit of Indian economy is very high. So there has been some discussion by Subhash Chandra also about that this year in this budget, uh, the government has tried to reflect the off-budget borrowings in this budget. That's why our fiscal deficit is around 9 point something, was around 9 point something. That's true. Um, the, the government of India has not been paying the Food Corporation of India for more than a decade now. Every year, the Food Corporation of India has huge, huge payments due. And to make that up, they, the, the FCI has to go and borrow, if you can imagine. And it has to then pay interest on what it is borrowing, which is ridiculous. But that is what is certainly what has been happening. It's not just the Food Corporation of India. It's, it's every a major public sector enterprise, government where owes vast quantities of money. And uh, so there's a lot of off budget things which the controller and auditor general has mentioned in a series of reports that have been extremely critical. So it is certainly true that the supposed increase in the food subsidy this year is because they paid back some of the unpaid uh, you know, uh, dues that they owe the FCI. <clears throat> but I would say that that's bad. They should have spent a lot more. This is the time when you have to increase spending, not reduce it. What is shocking to me is not that they spent so much, but that they didn't spend so much. Even accounting for the FCI, total government spending went up by only 6% in real terms. That's ridiculous. That's like not even 2%, 1.5% one, one of GDP increase. And I have just been telling you, even Brazil spent, what, 6 to 7% of GDP additional. This is the time when you have to spend. This is your rainy day. This is your period of crisis or catastrophe. And let's also understand what happens when you spend or don't spend. If you spend, then you actually allow that economy to recover faster. Because you are providing some incomes some expansion of demand and that generates multiplier effects as we all know if you don't spend what happens households are collapsing they're not spending more consumption is down investment is down obviously in any case investment rates were coming down but investment is down because 
you know, markets are not going up, the domestic consumption is falling. And then if the government also doesn't spend, then the economy goes into an even worse spiral. So the lack of additional spending is really because uh, it, it really leads to a worse economic situation. So why is the fiscal deficit so high if the government didn't spend so much more? Okay, because revenues collapsed. And again, that's a no brainer. Obviously, revenues will collapse. And once again, this is circular. If you have this pandemic, you have a lockdown, you close everything and so on. There's no economic activity, then clearly indirect taxes come down. People lose their incomes, profits, you know, etc. Then obviously, direct taxes come down. Revenues are going to collapse. You know that. If you can manage to make economic activity re revive, your revenues would have also gone up, right? In other words, yes, up to September was a mess. If you had managed to actually, let's say, vaccinate more people and have more public spending, your economic activity would have revived and revenues would have gone up. So your fiscal deficit may not have been that large. Yeah. Okay. There's another question by uh, Asad Ahmed. Please unmute yourself, sir, and ask your question. Uh, JP, it's uh, been a uh, real pleasure listening to you. Uh, so you recognize that, really. Well, I've got two very small uh, observations or questions. Uh, uh, we have had uh, an economic crisis. We have seen the Great Depression the last century. Uh, where do you see, uh, do, you th do you foresee any kind of repetition of that? That is on the world stage. Secondly, you have just talked about uh, NPAs and all, and uh, we have just seen this uh, faulty de steps like demonetization and GST, economies in complete doldrums. So where does India go from here? So two very small questions. Oh, wow. Uh, very small questions indeed. <laughs> you know, I would say we are really in uncharted territory. You know, there's a lot of comparison with the interwar period and the depression and so on. I personally, th I'm, I'm a little more worried. I, I think the situation is potentially worse. And I think it's worse because of a couple of things. The first is that, you know, that Great Depression, uh, there's a wonderful book by Kittelberger. I don't know if you students read it. It's The World in Depression, uh, looking at the Great Depression. And... He basically says that the reason it was so intense and so prolonged and so widespread is because there was no global leader who was willing to do three things, you know, discounting in crisis, that is bail out when you need to bail out, counter cyclical mm. lending, provide resources to the parts of the world economy that don't have the money and a market for distress exports, absorb the exports that those countries that, you know, will borrow will then need to uh, generate to repay. The IMF and the World Bank were supposed to do that, right? That was the reason they were set up in the Bretton Woods conference. They haven't mm -hmm. done that. They haven't worked that way. The US, is, <clears throat> so far as we have a global leader, it's the US. It's not willing to do that. There is no other agency in the economy. China is not strong enough. The EU is not, you know, with it together enough to do that. So in a way, we really don't have either a global leader or a global arrangement that would do that. What does that mean? It means that when you have a, a crisis, it will be intense, prolonged, and widespread. That's the first point. The second point is that, you know, all this was in a world where the economy could go ticking along without, you know, recognizing that the planet is also a problem, that nature <laughs> can come back and bite you. Yeah. And so we are now in a different world. It's not like a century ago. It's not like even, you know, in the post-war period. This is a different world because these planetary changes have massive implications. You know, I mean, we are going to get, we are, it's a matter of a decade before we get major climate refugees. I mean, some of our coastal cities are going to be underwater. We're going yes. to see, you know, flooding and avalanches and, we are going to see mm. salinification in a lot of agrarian areas. We are going to see major droughts in certain... I mean, these are not... I'm not being alarmist. This is what the IPCC report is telling us. All yes. of this is going to happen. Some of our cities are going to be unlivable, right? Now, all of that is hugely... Um, you know, it requires massive public investment. 
and coordination across countries. I just don't see that happening. There is public investment. I mean, Biden put in a lot of the green investments in his plan, his new infrastructure plan. One senator from West Virginia has thrown it all out because he has a wafer thin majority. Biden, he can't do it without that senator. It's all gone. So even the US is not spending more on all of these essential things. They're spending yes. a lot of money, but they're not spending on what we will need globally. Mm. And forget about us. Huh? We are encouraging coal investment. We are, I mean, we make our own errors of omission, commission for sure, like demonetization and a terrible GST. And we do all our errors of commission. But we also do errors of omission. We're not spending where we must. So yes. I'm, I think it's a worse situation. I hate to be really depressing. But it means... You know, the need for action is even more intense and more urgent in a way. Where does India stand in this? Oh, God. You know, there's a lot of wasted opportunity. Here we were with this demographic dividend. Here we were with, okay, not enough educated people, but more and more educated people than before with much more aspirations. and everything. It's been destroyed almost... I know comprehensively, you know, and that's terrifying. That's terrifying. I mean, uh, employment opportunities, you know, the, the government has operated in a way kind of pretending that you can. I'm sorry, I just turned this down. The, uh, the government has operated kind of pretending that you only have to look at the formal sector, which employs less than 15% of our workforce. Yeah. And we know that each thing that is happening disproportionately impacts informal activities. Demonetization, <laughs> right? GST. Now the pandemic. I mean, who was wiped out? It was all the small players. I mean, small enterprises, micro enterprises. It's a miracle that any of them survives at all. So I am really worried about India. And we also know that, you know, you can't just keep bashing the informal sector. It comes back to bite the formal sector because demand collapses. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm, I'm worried about India. Let me be honest. I have hope, hope in the younger generation. I think they're smarter than we were. So they, <laughs> they will find a way out of it. We're leaving them a big mess. But we'll find a way out. <laughs> okay. Another question is by Uma, LBC. Uh, she's from Delhi University. Please unmute Uma and ask your question. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. It was very thought-provoking lecture. Uh, my question is that so far when we read about China, we come to know about this, that China um, uh, followed all the policies so strategically, be it in the form of education or in the field of uh, social sector, if we take the other areas like health also. But if we talk about just now, you said that they are moving now on artificial intelligence and robotization, etc. So instead, that they are not thinking about the labor abundance what the country is actually they are having and generally they were focusing more to manufacturing sector so currently they are by means uh, they are ignoring this sector so in that way the progress may be affected if we talk of china yeah that's a very interesting question uma and you know i i have such mixed feelings about china because you know there are some things in which some ways in which it is truly remarkable and i think one of the most important is possibly even you know a legacy of the Chinese revolution, which is the dignity of labor. You know, you go to China, you will see sanitation workers who look well fed, decent, with uniforms, with gloves, with protective equipment, with social security, compared to a sanitation worker in India. In other words, you know, there is a real dignity of labor there, which is huge. Okay. But I think uh, you're right that China used manufacturing as its means to get out. And it was lucky because it did it at a time when manufacturing also meant more and more employment. So at one point it had 40% of the, 45% of the workforce in manufacturing, okay? Which is massive. Um, it is now shifting to a service-based economy and to high value manufacturing. So one of the things that happened is that in 2010, the Chinese leadership of the time, that is pre-Xi Jinping, decided that they really have to put a lot of money into innovation and R&D because, you know, they've been managing to copy Western 
uh, things, but they now have to develop their own. And so they actively pursued an industrial policy that put an emphasis on technological progress. So they are now world leaders in robotization, in artificial intelligence, in some things that are really scary, like face recognition technology. But also in solar energy, wind energy, they are the, you know, they're the ones who brought the price down globally because they were producing at such scale that the global prices came down and are now competitive with oil, you know. So uh, they did some brilliant things, I would say. It is also, however, a very, very autocratic, uh, authoritarian regime. Okay, it's a terrifying regime. So yes, while they are really smart, I mean, there's no question about it. They're really smart about doing things. And they think ahead. They don't just think next few years. And, you know, uh, they have a, they, maybe it's because there are no economists, it's all engineers who are doing it. Whatever it is, they, they're very smart in many ways. But they are also deeply, deeply authoritarian. And the, the current regime of Xi Jinping has made it much, much more extreme. Okay, his anti-corruption drive was a way of getting rid of all the rivals in the Communist Party. It wasn't really about, you know, I mean, there's a lot of corruption still, but he got rid of the ones he didn't like or who were a threat to him and uh, used it. As we now know, politicians everywhere use anti-corruption drives for that, to get into power and, and keep their rivals from emerging. Uh, but also the kind of surveillance and monitoring that China does, it's unimaginable. You know, they have a social ranking which uh, decides whether you can get a high-speed train, take an air flight, go in, into a particular city, get a particular job. And all of this is decided on the basis of whether you're, you know, everything they know about you, and they know everything. They know who you've been talking to, where you have been, which books you've been reading, which online sites you go to. They know everything. And if they decide you are any kind of threat, then you don't, you can't do all this. You are rendered immobile. You cannot get a job. You cannot travel. You cannot do this. And they can enforce this because they are using face recognition technology like nothing. They've got everywhere. They can capture your face and they track it over time. They track every billion faces over time. Okay? So it's terrifying. Is that a model I want to see for India? No, it is not. There are bits... It's, it's happening in India too, right? Huh? We've had the chief minister of Delhi brag about how, how many CCTVs he's got and how they're going to bring in face recognition and so on. It's happening to a lesser scale. And frankly, we're more inefficient, so thank God it won't be so bad. But uh, it's terrifying. So, you know, I have very mixed feelings about China. I, 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 I cannot see this as my ideal for a country because that they, they're very, very smart and clever, and they provide the basic needs of the people in a very efficient way. And they also protect the people from hazards, you know, vulnerabilities, floods, pandemic, etc., in very top-down but efficient ways. But it's also scary. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. Re recently, I was reading an article, and I saw in that article, it was written that employees are quite dissatisfied with the policies, what they are bringing. So in that way, this, this dissatisfaction is affecting the productivity also. You know, that's China. the question. And that's one of those things we're going to find out over time that can you do a top down economy? Can it work? You know, that's really yes. what they've done. They've done a top down economy. Can yes. that work? Uh, we'll have to see. I don't think it can. But, you know, who knows? Thank you so much. <laughs> Actually, I'm just I'm just uh, on road and going somewhere. Yeah. So that's why I have not switched on the camera. Ma'am, thank you so much. I was listening your lecture very carefully. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, Ma'am, can we take a few more questions? Yeah, sure. Okay, Sheila Ditta, please unmute and ask your question. Okay, let me read another question by Deepa C. Ma'am, she's asking, the trade-off between lives and livelihood is indeed real. So as work from home policies are increasing, what does it entail for jobs that aren't adaptable for the lifestyle? How do we cope up with the acute job shortage right now? Okay, uh, Rita Shri, I don't agree. There is no trade-off between lives and livelihoods. That's what we were told, but I, I disagree. I believe we could have done a different way of coping with the disease, not a national lockdown when you have only 600 cases in the whole country, and that too in only four states. 
you didn't need a national lockdown. Even China never did a national lockdown. They locked down Wuhan for two months. And whenever it emerged in some other city, like say Beijing or Shanghai, they would do a temporary lockdown in that place. We did a national lockdown and it was like a curfew, right? It was like a military curfew. People were bashed if they were on the road. People who were trying to eke a living were just, you know, I mean, you, we saw how migrants walking for hundreds of kilometers were attacked and so on. None of this was necessary. We, and, you know, it's not even as if we are giving any social protection. So we told everybody, you cannot go out and earn a living for the next three months. Really, that's what happened. But we will not pay you anything. If you're lucky and you have a ration card under the NFSA, you can get five kilograms free grain. That's it. We will not give you anything. Who does that? Which country in the world did that? Even in South Asia, you had better social protection in other poor countries, right? So I don't believe that this trade-off between lives and livelihoods uh, is, is a good way of putting it. I think we managed to destroy both. Because, you know, people who lose their livelihoods, hunger also kills, okay? We know that the cases of TB, India has the largest number of increased TB cases in the world in this period. Children have not been immunized in this period. Many women could not access childbirth facilities in this period, and so on and so forth. You know, cancer patients, people who need dialysis. I mean, lots of lives were lost because we did a very mindless, blatant kind of crackdown. So I, I don't think that there's a, I think that's what we keep getting told. Oh, you know, you have to choose between lives and livelihoods. Nonsense. We sacrificed the lives of the poor to save some notion of middle class safety. That's how I feel, okay? Uh, I'm sure there will be a disagreement, but that's how I feel. Okay, so the next question is raised by Harsh Huda. He's asking, do the environment benefits seen as a result of this global slowdown hint at the potential positive impacts of a Green New Deal? You know, there is no doubt that a Green New Deal is not just possible and viable, but necessary. We have to do it uh, for all the reasons that I have mentioned. It's urgent. But on the other hand, what worries me is that because of that two track that we talked about, you know, the rich countries can still go in for Green New Deals and so on. But the developing world is not doing that. It's going in the opposite direction. India has deregulated its environmental laws. It's given more freedom to pollute and to destroy and to it's investing. I mean, you know, everyone's read the newspaper today. They're all saying more investment in coal is required. Yeah. So we are doing the opposite. We're going in the wrong direction. And why are we going in that wrong direction? Because we are desperate now to revive economic activity at any cost. You know, really, that's what's happening. And I, that's the case in a bunch of other countries that they are not just desperate to revive economic growth, so they're not doing green stuff. You know, they, they're not doing mitigation, adaptation, so forget about it. You know, they can't afford adaptation. They're not doing the adaptation either. So I think the worry for me really is not uh, whether Green New Deal is viable. I think it is not just viable. It's the only viable way out. But that my worry is that not enough governments are recognizing that. And certainly in the developing world, certainly India is not, but a lot of other developing countries are not recognizing that enough. I noticed that Dipali Sharma has asked about the main lessons India needs to learn from COVID. Yes. Uh, okay. So I think there are a few that I will quickly highlight because I really need to leave in another three minutes. And I'm, I'm sorry, I have another thing uh, right now. So, um, the first is that you cannot have decades of underinvestment in health without costs, not just for your people, but even for the economy. In other words, if you don't have a vibrant, viable public health system, then you will be floored by any health threat, like the pandemic. And OK, the pandemic is a big one, but we were completely floored. And it was not just your society that will suffer. It is your economy. You will not have a resilient economy unless you really invest massively in public health. And we can see countries that did that, Vietnam, Thailand, countries that are also relatively poor developing countries, they have weathered this so much better 
than us. And it's really because they invested in public health. Okay, the second lesson I would say is that, you know, inequalities um, are not just worsened by a pandemic. It is that they make the pandemic worse. So the fact that we have such inequalities and then we have a completely insensitive response. We tell everybody maintain distance. I mean, this terrible word, social distancing, right? What do you mean social? It's physical distancing. We are the world experts in social distancing, right? We began with caste. So we are very good at social distancing. But what is the advisory that we get from our health ministry? Six feet apart at all times. Wash your hands frequently with soap and sing happy birthday twice or whatever it is while you're doing it. How many poor people in this country can do that? Think of the urban slums, okay? 40% of urban India lives in slums where there are five, six people to a room and tiny tenements right next to each other. Where is this six feet of this thing going to come from? How many people have access to piped water in their homes so that they can keep washing their hands with soap and water endlessly? How many, even in urban India, and of course in rural India, it's a whole different ball game, have to go and fetch water and carry it in buckets and store those buckets and pay for those buckets sometimes. And then how much of that water can you afford for just hand washing as opposed to just all your daily needs? And we had yet a whole government system in central and state governments telling people, you must do this. And then we're very surprised when it doesn't work. We're very surprised when people are, you know, getting zero positive surveys and uh, finding that lots in, in uh, slums in Mumbai, 80% of people are zero positive and so on. Obviously, because obviously that kind of strategy cannot be applied. It's based on a deep inequality and it makes the inequality worse. So the inequality between informal and informal sectors, between men and women, women were disproportionately thrown out of the workforce between high caste and low caste, between majority and minority uh, religious communities, and so on and so forth. I could go on and on. All of these have been exacerbated by the pandemic and have made it worse. So the second big lesson I would say is that if we don't address inequalities, any shock, not just a health shock, but any shock, is really going to completely floor us. OK. Thank you so much, ma'am. I would like to invite Gagan now for the vote of thanks. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Economics Department of SDDB Khalsa College, I would like to express my gratitude towards our esteemed speaker, Professor Jayati Ghosh, for taking time out from her busy schedule and sharing immense knowledge with us today. Personally, I found the session very, very informative, and I'm sure our students feel the same way. We are fortunate to receive this knowledge from you, ma'am. Once again, thank you so much, ma'am. It is our immense pleasure to have you with us. I would take this opportunity to thank our principal, sir, Professor Jaswinder Singh, for always encouraging us in our departmental activities. Our vice principal, sir, Professor Jassil, for, for supporting us and for joining us today. I must thank convener of Economic Society and department for organizing this event and all other faculty members for their support. A special thanks to our student council for their extraordinary efforts in making this event a success. And lastly, I wish to thank all the members of the audience for joining us today. Thank you, everyone, once again. I would now request you all to switch on your cameras for the group photograph. Can you manage everybody's photos in here? Yeah. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay. So, Pratyush, take the screenshot, please. Yes, ma'am. Thank, Thank you, Thank you so much, ma'am. Thanks, Thanks for Thank, Thank you so much, ma'am. All the best. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am.